Okay, <clears throat> folks, um, I'm assuming that the sound is okay. Uh, just type in the chat if you don't mind. Okay, perfect. Good, I see that there's quite a big group here tonight, so... Tonight's a very interesting, uh, today was a very interesting day, and tonight as well, obviously. <clears throat> it is the 18th day of the month of Elul, um, the month before the High Holy Days in uh, Jewish tradition is a month of preparation, and this month in particular is uh, highly significant in Hasidic um, lore, because it is the time of the birth of the Baal Shem Tov, the Baal Shem Tov being the founder of uh, Hasidic, Hasidism. Uh, and not only the founder of Hasidism, but the life force of uh, Hasidism to this very day. There's a difference between just being the founder and being the life force, being the energy behind it and the continuing energy behind it, as maybe we'll discuss soon. <clears throat> This was also the day when, at the age of 36, his teacher, um, and I'll speak about who his teacher was in a minute, his teacher um, exhorted him to reveal himself as who he was. Uh, and very reluctantly, he did so. He'd been living a very secluded life up until that time, until the age of 36, uh, mostly spending his time in study and meditation. And it was only because of his teacher that he started revealing himself, in other words, started revealing his teachings. And this day, the 18th of Elul, is the day that celebrates his birthday. Um, <clears throat> It is also significant from various other, there's another birthday, the birthday of Rabbi Shneur Zaman al the founder and life force and spirit of the Chabad movement, Chabad Lubavitch movement. It also happens to be the day of the passing of the Maharal of Prague, of Golem fame, the one who invented, who created the Golem, the humanoid that protected the Jewish people in the city of Prague from various marauders and so on and so forth. Anyway, it is a very, very significant day, and it's regarded in many ways as sort of the, um, the birthday, essentially, of Hasidism. It's the birthday of Hasidic, of Hasidic thought. So it's a very, very significant day. Now, the teacher of the Baal Shem Tov was someone whose name was Achia Hashiloni. Achia Hashiloni. Um, I'll type that in the chat box here if anyone who wants to see. Achia ha shiloni. Achia shiloni. Oh, that should be with a ch. Achia ha shiloni. So who is Achia shiloni? Achia shiloni was actually the the um, he was the teacher of Elijah the prophet. He was the teacher of Elijah. In other words, he was one of the 48 prophets who are spoken about in the Torah. Altogether in the Torah and prophetic writings, there's altogether 48 prophets, and he was one of them, the teacher of Elijah, Eliyahu. <clears throat> now, you may ask the question, but surely he wasn't living in the world anymore at this time. I mean, the Baal Shem Tov lived in the 1600s, late 1600s, um, and... Achia Shiloni lived at the time of the uh, first temple. So surely, um, which was 3,000 years ago. So what do, we, what do we mean that he was the teacher of the Baal Shem Tov? 
So in order to explain this, um, there is a teaching of Rabbi Yitzhak Luria where he explains that there are various forms of divine inspiration, or as it's called in Hebrew, Ruach HaKodesh. Divine inspiration, Ruach HaKodesh. Um, there are various other translations of the same, um, it's sort of, in a sense, prophecy, but a certain type of prophecy. Called Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, if you want to translate it directly, but it's usually translated as um, divine inspiration. In any event, there are five levels of divine inspiration. The lowest level of divine inspiration is um, when a person is enlightened by a dream. Uh, I've mentioned this uh, on a number of occasions before. I'm just going to go through it quickly so you can understand what uh, was going on over here. Um, when a person is enlightened by a dream, in other words, a dream is a prophetic dream, that is said to be a certain level of Ruach HaKodesh, of, uh, of divine inspiration. And this is available basically to everybody, um, whether male or female, old or young, Jew or non-Jew. Um, we see example, Nebuchadnezzar had prophetic dreams. Pharaoh had prophetic dreams. Joseph had prophetic dreams, and so on and so forth. So, it's something that's available basically to everybody. On a higher level, there is the revelation of Elijah the prophet or Eliyahu Anovi. In some circumstances, for some reasons, Elijah reveals himself to a person either to rescue him from a very dangerous situation or alternatively to reveal to him one of the secrets of the Torah because Eliyahu, Elijah, is one of the bearers of the keys to the secrets. The other bearer of the keys is his teacher, Achia Hashiloni. So that's the second level of, uh, of divine inspiration. A third level of divine inspiration is when a person gets um, a personal spiritual teacher called a Magid. The most famous Magid was the Magid of Rabbi Yosef Karo, the author of the Jewish Code of Law, or the Code of Jewish Law, um, the Shuhan Aruch. He had a Magid, and uh, he speaks about his Magid in a very interesting book, which is called Magid Meisharim, the straightforward or the straight-speaking Magid, right? Or the upright Magid, the upright teacher, <coughs> forthrightness. There's been various, various ways of explaining the word Meisharim. In any event, that's a higher level. <clears throat> the two highest levels, however, are when the root of the soul reveals itself to a person. And when a person gets, that's the second highest level, when his own soul root is revealed to him, and that, it would seem, is largely the methodology of Hasidic teachings. The methodology of Hasidut, of Hasidus, of Hasidic teachings is precisely that, to reveal the essence of the soul to the person. In other words, the person living down below, so to speak, in his consciousness should be revealed the essence of his soul, the root of his soul as it is above. The highest level is one called Ibur Nishmat HaTzadik. Ibur Nishmat HaTzadik, which means the impregnation of the soul of a tzadik into his own soul. We spoke about this recently, but I'm just uh, sort of recapping the idea. When the soul of someone who is of the same soul root, but on a loftier level, becomes, so to speak, his personal guide and his personal um, uh, mentor. It would seem that this is what happened with the Baal Shem Tov and his teacher. His teacher, Achi Hashiloni, was the Ibur Neshama, the impregnation of the soul of Achia into his soul in order to lead him and guide him uh, from above. So the Baal Shem Tov, this day that the Baal Shem Tov revealed himself at the age of 36, was a tremendously significant day in the Jewish calendar, in the Hasidic calendar in particular. It was on this day um, in the year, 
um, 5652 in the Jewish calendar, which is 1892. In the year 1892, the fifth Chabad Rebbe, the fifth Chabad spiritual leader, was called the Rebbe Rashab, Rabbi Shalom Dov Ber. Um, was in a very meditative state on this day. It happened to be a Sabbath day. It was the Shabbat. It was the Shabbos. And he sort of, let's say, drifted away so that his soul ascended to the Garden of Eden, to Gan Eden. His soul ascended to Gan Eden, not just to Gan Eden, not just to the Garden of Eden, but to a very lofty level of the Garden of Eden, where he heard the, te- the Baal Shem Tov teaching Torah on this week's Torah reading. On this week's parasha, which is called Parashat Kitavo, as you probably saw previously uh, when I showed you uh, when I showed you the screen. Um, it says, Kitavo. Let me just mute somebody. Uh, no, nobody needs muting here. All good. Okay, so <laughs> I need to mute the phone. Okay, um, good. Okay, so it says in Parashat Kitavo, the, amongst the first uh, verses, it says like this It will be when you come to the land. When you come to the land, man, that means the Holy Land, the land of Israel, which is called Eretz, Eretz Israel. When you come to the land that God gives you for an inheritance, and you will inherit it and dwell in it, then you have to bring from the first fruits uh, of the land, the first fruits of the land, and you bring them in the basket, and you bring them up to Jerusalem, and there you offer it in the temple as an offering. So the Baal Shem Tov expounded on this verse. And what he said was as follows. And again, this is being repeated by the fifth, fifth Lubavitch Rebbe who heard it in Gan Eden, in the Garden of Eden. Now, um, just something I didn't explain, which I think requires some explanation. When we say the Garden of Eden, what do we mean? <clears throat> Although it would seem if we take a literal reading of the Torah and a literal reading is one of the ways of reading the Torah, definitely literally, but there are obviously various dimensions and various layers of meaning and of understanding. So the literal layer of of understanding is that Gan Eden, the garden of Eden is some kind of physical place that existed between two rivers and so on and so forth. And in fact, that is, that is true. Only what, when the world was created, it was on so much more of an elevated level of existence that that today is hidden from us. So it's not that there's no longer any Gan Eden, no more Garden of Eden. It's just that it exists on a spiritual level. Now, let me explain what I mean by this. Let's just give a very mundane, a very uh, sort of physical example. <clears throat> If one is explaining, let's say, to a young child, um, you want to explain to him some kind of mathematical concept that a, something that is true under all circumstances, anywhere, anywhere it's true here on Earth, it's true up on the moon, it would be true on Mars, it would be true out in the universe, on uh, whatever, in the Milky Way, it doesn't matter. Two plus two equals four. Now, how do you teach a child that idea? So you take two apples and two oranges or two apples and other two apples and you tell him two apples plus two apples equals four apples, right? And same thing with oranges. Two oranges plus two oranges equals four oranges or bananas and then pens and then chairs and then people or whatever may happen to be until the child is able to grasp the concept of two X plus two X equals four X. Anywhere, anytime, any place, independent of what objects it is that we are talking about. It doesn't have to be apples or bananas or chairs or people or uh, photographs or anything else. It doesn't matter what it is. 2x plus 2x equals 4x. 
Now, if you would ask me, where does this 2x exist? It certainly doesn't exist as if you go searching with a magnifying glass or with a telescope, you won't find an x anywhere around that you could see that this is the 2x plus 2x. It's not tied down to a physical object. Why? Because it's a, in a sense, a mathematical construct. It's a, um, it's a meta level of thinking. It's a meta level of thinking. The Garden of Eden also is a meta form of existence. It's not existence as uh, in, in, in a physical sense that you would uh, sort of be, um, you know, eating grapes and drinking wine and pursuing 70 virgins, <laughs> whatever the various versions of, uh, of uh, the Garden of Eden are in, um, in uh, one way or another. Oh, sorry, I missed, uh, I missed before what Yael asked. What's the fourth level? The fourth level is the revelation of a person's soul to himself. Yeah? Okay, so. The Garden of Eden is also, as we said before, it's sort of a meta-existence. And in that meta-existence, there's also many levels of that meta-existence. There's the existence aspect of it and there's the more spiritual aspect of it or the the essence of what it's all about there is the existence of the thing and there's the essence of the thing when the Rebbe Rashab had this aliyat Shama, when he had this elevation of soul and he rose up to the consciousness of the level of the Garden of Eden where he could hear the teachings of the Baal Shem Tov and subsequently record them and tell them to us, he was sort of on a meta level of spirituality. It wasn't just the spirituality of this world that surrounds us. He was on a much higher spiritual level, just as, although obviously differently, 2x plus 2x equals 4x is different from 2 apples plus 2 apples equals 4 apples. The latter is just one substantiation of that formula. Now, if you would go up several levels beyond that, beyond that, uh, that, that paradigm, 2x plus 2x equals 4x, if there would be such a mathematical way of doing it, I'm not really a mathematician, so I can't tell you. But let's say there would be a higher level reality, a higher plane of thinking, and then a plane beyond that, and a plane beyond that, and that might be analogous to the concept of what the Garden of Eden is. Now, when we say the Garden of Eden, basically what it means, there, there, really, there are really two aspects to it. There's the garden aspect of it, and then there's the Eden aspect of it. Uh, if someone's on the phone, if you wouldn't mind muting yourself by pressing star six, uh, that would do the trick. Yeah, there you go. Perfect. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And... Um, Okay, and so um, the, um, the concept of the Garden of Eden is really two concepts. It's Eden and Garden, or Gan and Eden. Eden really is a metaphor for the inner dimension of the Sphira of Chokhmah. Again, it's a metaphor for the Sphira of Chochmah. Now, what I would suggest to everybody, um, it's a little more problematic bringing up uh, various screens. It's possible to do, but it's just more problematic. And what I would suggest to everybody is if you don't mind going to the website at some time, not now, but another time, and you can download there a chart of the Svirot and have it ready so that we don't have to uh, dredge it up every time. A little bit more difficult on this platform than the other platform, at least for me right now. Um, I guess I'll get used to it and that won't be such a problem. But um, in any event, for now, um, just remember the Sphira of Chokhmah. Of the imminent Sphirot, Chokhmah is the most elevated. There are two, there, there really, um, there's a division between the Sphirot, the transcendent Sphirot, or rather the, the transcendent Sphira, which is the Sphira of Keter. The Sphira of Keter is transcendent, which corresponds in the human being 
to his delight, the inner dimension, to his will, the outer dimension of the transcendent sphere of Keter. The Sphira of Chokhmah, therefore, is the first, which the Sphira that comes after Keter, is the first imminent Sphira, about which it says, Chokhmah emerges from nothingness. It emerges from the nothingness of Keter because Keter is transcendent. It doesn't have dimensions that we use, that we think about, that we understand in this physical world. So therefore, it is called a transcendent sphere. It's not a, it's an unlimited, it's a transcendent and infinite sphere, Keter. So Chokhmah emerges from there. The inner aspect of Chokhmah is called Aden. Aden is sometimes, has sometimes been translated as delight. It's the first manifestation of the inner dimension of Keter within the Sfirot, within the inner dimension of the manifested Sfirot, in other words, the Sfirot of Chochmah. So it's the revelation of Keter in Chochmah, in the inner dimension of Chochmah, which is called Eden, that is then brought down to and revealed within Gan. Gan is Malchut. So when we say Gan is in the Garden of Eden, what we mean is the inner dimension of Chokhmah, the delight that there is in Chokhmah is revealed in the Gan, in the Garden, so to speak, in Malchut. So when this, the soul of the, the Rebbe ascended to Gan Eden, to the Garden of Eden, he was ascending to a very lofty, to a very lofty world, to a very lofty level, very lofty spiritual level, obviously, where he was able to participate in a discourse. He was hearing an innovative discussion that was going on in the Garden of Eden, in the, so to speak, yeshiva, in the, uh, the seminary, if you like to say, or the, uh, the study hall of the Baal Shem Tov. Now, there's no study halls over there, obviously. It's just a mode of expression. Now, it's not, um, this, this is not something that has never happened before in Jewish history. The Talmud mentions discussions that were going on in heavenly spheres. Kamipalgib and Mesifta the Rekia, where the sages were arguing in the heavenly court one of the heavenly chambers that were discussing and, uh, or disagreeing about the interpretation of something in the heavenly court. They were arguing in the, um, in the chambers or in the, uh, the yeshiva, the study hall of the spiritual worlds. So it's not something that is unknown. We could call the Garden of Eden divine delight, yes. Or let us put it a little bit more um, correctly, not divine delight, but delight in the divine. In other words, not God's delight, it's our delight in God. That would be a better way of putting it. <clears throat> okay, so. When the Rebbe rose up to that level and he was overhearing, he was invited in. You can't go if you're not, <laughs> if you're not invited. He, um, he was invited uh, to come in and he went in and he listened to the discourse. And there were seven teachings that he heard and that he revealed over the course of that Sabbath. The first two he revealed uh, were, 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 were revealed more in a public forum and some of the other ones were more sort of revealed kind of more privately. And in fact, when the Baal Shem Tov said them in the heavenly spheres, the first two were said in, in public, so to speak, and the rest of them were said to people who had been in their lives spiritual leaders in the world. And... This is also being said to the Rebbe Rashab, 
who was also a spiritual leader in his time. Can you call it a state of mind? It's a state of consciousness. I don't think you call it a state of mind. Uh, mind is more a brain function. Uh, consciousness is also really, in some sense, a brain function. But we're talking about beyond brain, and we're talking about in uh, the soul consciousness, a very high level of soul consciousness. Okay, so now we have to understand what it is that the, um, the what was the teaching. So the first teaching was on the verse, it will be when you come into the land, yes, soul consciousness, when you come into the land that God gives you for inheritance and you will inherit it and dwell in it. So <clears throat> the Baal Shem Tov um, noted that the Midrash, the Midrash, the Midrash is rabbinic literature from um, probably around 4th, 5th, no, uh, yeah, third between the 3rd and the 6th century probably, between the 3rd and the 6th century, Midrash. <clears throat> so Midrash notes uh, that Eretz, and I'm reading here, if anyone is interested, I'm reading here from the English Hayom Yom. Hayom Yom is a book that was written by the Lubavitch Rebbe, uh, and the, uh, our Rebbe, the Rebbe of uh, our generation, um, but some of the teachings of that he heard from his father-in-law, or that his father-in-law wrote, who was the Rebbe prior to him. So he was the seventh Lubavitch Rebbe, and he heard this from the sixth Lubavitch Rebbe, who heard it from his father, who was the Rebbe Rashab. So this is what he said. It's it's in the uh, Hayom Yom for the 18th of Elul. Let me just put the book in front of you so you can see Hayom Yom. <laughs> in Hebrew, you can't really see the title, Hayom Yom. Okay, there you go. In any event, it says as follows. <clears throat> the Midrash knows that Eretz, the word Eretz, uh, the word Eretz in the verse, which means land, is an idiom of Merutza and of Ratzon. Merutza means running, and Ratzon means will or desire. So when you come to the land, in other words, when you come to will, or desire, and you come to it in a way of running towards it. Now, what do I mean running towards it? Running towards it as opposed to being dragged towards it. In other words, you come with enthusiasm, with energy, with, uh, with life force. Um, I'll just tell you, just incidentally, I volunteer for a, um, a suicide hotline and um, I'm on sometimes, once a week, sometimes, more than once a week, a few times a week, sometimes, whatever. In any event, um, last night I had a person on who thought she was very depressed, but she was incredibly energetic. <laughs> you know, she, her answers were almost immediate and she was typing fast and she was sharp and so on and so forth. So I told her, you know, you're not depressed. There's no question about you're not depressed. The state of depression is a state of incredibly low energy. Here we're talking about the opposite of low energy. She was a state of high energy. See, when people are really depressed, they have high energy in rumination and low energy in everything else. But when people are in a state of high energy in a general sense, yeah, in a sense, depression is a manic state. Yeah, it's a manic state in the opposite in the opposite of the um, the opposite end of the spectrum. It's 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 deeply into one thing. It's almost a hypnotic state, if the truth be told. Uh, depression is almost an, an hypnotic state. Almost. In any event, let's not get into the psychology of it now. But um, when we're talking about the land being the concept of um, running towards, running towards means doing what it is that you are doing with enthusiasm, with energy, with liveliness, with commitment, with uh, dedication, devotion. That's what we mean. Rather than sort of being dragged to it unwillingly. Now, what are you running towards? 
you're running towards the will or desire to do a certain thing. You're enthusiastic about manifesting a certain will, a certain desire, a certain uh, what is called a ratzon. He goes on to explain, when you attain the level of ratzon desire that is a gift from above, when you come to, in other words, when you come into the land that God gives you for an inheritance, in other words, you inherit that. Anyone who wants to inherit that land, that the will, that desire can do so. It's not something which uh, is restricted. It's available. When you inherit it means it becomes your possession then what must you do? You must dwell in it. When you inherit it, in other words, it's given into your possession, then you must dwell in it. What does it mean, dwell in it? It means to bring godliness into that state of being, into that land, so to speak. Now, what do we mean? The purpose, what he is saying over here is coming into the land that God gives you as an inheritance, you have to make that land, whatever that land is, it doesn't mean necessarily only the land of Israel or only the Holy Land, but the land where you are now. In other words, the space that you occupy, your space. This is the way it's explained. This is the way that teaching is explained. When in the space that you occupy, you have to bring divinity, you have to bring godliness, you have to bring the revelation into that space that you occupy. How do you do that? So the verse continues, I don't have it here, but the verse continues and says, you shall take from the first fruits and place it in a basket, which the Baal Shem Tov explained is, draw down the spiritual energy or the spiritual light into the appropriate vessels. Because when you brought the first fruits to the temple, you had to bring them in a vessel. You couldn't just bring them uh, in your hands. You brought in a vessel. Wealthy people, interestingly enough, they brought silver vessels. And poor people brought grass baskets that they made out of uh, leaves and grass and so on poor people. Now, interestingly enough, the, there was a difference in how these baskets were treated. When the basket was given to the, to the priest, to the Kohen, so he did whatever it is that he did with it, he made it into an offering, but if it was a silver basket, he gave it back to the owner. If it was a grass basket, the one made out of uh, reeds or uh, branches or whatever, that became part of the offering. It remained there. It remained in the temple. It became part of the offering. In other words, the simplest vessels are the ones that remain in a state of holiness. A person who's coming and he's, in a sense, let's say, showing off his wealth by bringing his fruit in a gold or a silver basket, that gold or silver basket goes back to its owner. It doesn't become part of his, um, doesn't become part of the, it doesn't become part of the offering. A reed basket or a branch basket does. It becomes part of the uh, bamboo basket, becomes part of the offering. But the main point is that when you come to the desire to do something, to bring godliness into the world, how do you do that? Bring your first fruits. In other words, the primary things that you do in the world, the first fruits, the, uh, called in Hebrew, the bikurim, bikurim from the word bechor, bechor means the firstborn. Yeah, these are the first fruits. In other words, the best of the best, the creme de la creme, you bring to the Almighty. You make it part of your devotion, part of your offering. In other words, in time and in space and in soul, 
these are three dimensions that are spoken about in the Sefer Yetzirah, in time, you have to give a part of your day, preferably the best part of your day, i.e. the morning, which is the time that we're usually the freshest and the most awake and most alert, usually. <laughs> um, some of that day ought to be given to devotional practices, whether it's prayer, whether it's meditation, whether it's study, whether it's two of them or all three of them, some of that day has to be offered, so to speak, as the first fruits. That's in time. In space also, in other words, in our homes, there should be a place that we set aside in the home which is, so to speak, like a little sanctuary. It's a place where it is going to be easier to feel, feel holy. It's surrounded by positive things, not by negative things. So, for example, you wouldn't have a computer with video games in, <laughs> in, your, in your holy space. Um, it's a space perhaps of holy books. It's a space perhaps with pictures of saintly people. It's a space where you, I don't want to use, use the word space out because space out, it's, this, it's, the, it's the space where you space in. Let's put it that way. It's the space where you space in. You spa the space where you space into contact. Now, does it mean that only one place can be done? Okay, no, there can be many places. Um, but there should be a place in your house where you have that capability as well, where this is your space in room. So that's in, uh, in space. So we said time, some time of the day, probably the earliest part of the day, um, a space in your home. And then that's Olam Shana. And now in Nefesh, Olam space, Shana time. Now, soul, nefesh. There should be a place in your soul also. What does your soul mean? In the sense of your, your life force, your energy, your consciousness. Your, there should be a place in your consciousness which you set aside as a place for holiness, so to speak. It's a, uh, a consciousness of holiness. A consciousness of something greater than me. A con consciousness of what I am here for, a consciousness of purpose. Why am I here? I am here in order to manifest in the way that I can do it best, godliness in this world, manifest godliness in this, in this world in any way that a person is capable. And everybody's capable of doing it in a different way because otherwise your presence wouldn't be necessary. The fact that you're here in the world means you have a unique contribution to manifesting godliness in the world. Now, for some people, that might mean helping other people. Their consciousness is lending a helping hand, showing love to, uh, to your fellow man, which is, as we explained on Sunday, I think, love of God and love of fellow man are the same uh, two sides of the same coin. Or it could be, for some people, it could be study, or it could be teaching, or it could be music, holy music, and so on and so forth. But each one can contribute something of his spiritual being to the betterment, the improvement, the elevation, the uh, making holy, holier of this world. That's what it means to bring lights into the vessels, to bring the first fruits into vessels, to bring it into manifestation in the world around us, in time and in space and in soul, to make God known through your actions. Okay, are there questions?
preferably write the questions if there are any in the um, 